tough crowd today. Yeah. I don't know. Let's try it again. Good morning. Good morning. Fabulous crowd today. Good job. Um, I just have a few announcements. The first one is that um, immediately following this service, if you um, are in need of prayer or would like to pray, um, there will be an elder available right up here um, that will pray with you. I believe it's Jill. Is that or D? One of the two of them will be up here uh, anticipating your prayer needs. The church office is closed this Tuesday for July 4th. Um, and I also got word this morning that Pam Huss passed away. I don't have any other information about it, but when we do, I will share with you. Um, it'll come out in an all church email. Um, are there any other announcements? Oh, all right. With that, I invite you to open your hearts and your minds and we'll prepare for worship.
God of hope, we come into your presence this morning. With confidence that you will lead us here. Where there is sadness, bring joy. Where there is tiredness, bring refreshment. Where there is despair, bring a renewed sense of hope. Let this place be a sanctuary, a safe haven for us, a home for holy words and songs and prayers as we devote ourselves to you. Amen. contemplate a new day, we ask for your help. We want to be aware of your spirit leading us in the decisions we make, the conversations we have, and the work we do. The freedoms we find and have are in you as we work toward being one church, one community, and one nation. Let it be as it was written so long ago, under you. You lead and guide us and our trust remains in you, even when many needs pull at our hearts and try to draw us into their whirlpool. May your divine hand govern us so that we may remain aware of the calling we receive from you and always have a light shining into our lives to show us how to serve you. Let your power work wherever hearts respond to you on this earth. 
wherever the strength and wisdom of your Son is revealed, so that people acknowledge his deeds and ours in his name to honor you. Be with those who are the least noticed of your children. Keep them in your hands and enable us to be fellow workers who persevere courageously and confidently in your name. We ask all this as we say the prayer given to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the Sunday before um, the 4th of July holiday. And as all American things, the 4th of July has just become a reason to get together, eat food, and celebrate with people. <laughs> or at least that's all that I can find in it. Um, there are people that remember what it signifies but then there are people that get lost and it's just a time to celebrate, have fun. So when we come to this table, we don't need to get lost on what it is. It's not just a part of the service where we get together and we have communion. Why do we have communion? <coughs> well, we have communion because um, the flag and Independence Day represents everything that's law-based and national-based. 
but as you learn in school, there's that separation of church and state. It gives you the right to be in church wherever you see fit. That's where that ends. Once you come to church, it is all through Christ and God that gives you all of your other freedoms. You're given the freedom to sit here knowing that after death, you are going to be welcomed into a sweet embrace and a wonderful heaven. You know that your soul has already been spoken for and saved. There was already a battle before you were even born that was won by Christ because of his love for us. All that is asked is that once you accept Christ, that you then show that love to everybody else, regardless of their nationality, their ethnic allegiances, or any indifferences that you have. You're supposed to show that love to everyone that you come across so that they get a glimpse of that love. And it might cause them to then turn to Christ. So as we gather around this table, because hey, food. It's not a food that's going to nourish you and keep you going day to day from a scientific standpoint of, oh, it's going to give you the nourishment you need. It gives you the nourishment that your soul needs. It gives you the nourishment that your faith needs to keep going. So as we gather around this table and as you gather with your family later on this week, Remember that you're gathering with those people that you love just like Jesus gathered with those that he loved all those many years ago. He gathered with them and he took a loaf of bread and he broke that bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. For as often as you eat of this, do so in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took a cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant a new covenant poured out for the remission of sins. So he was forgiving sins that hadn't even been committed yet. So by eating this bread and drinking of this cup, we do so in his name until he comes again. Will you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we ask that you take this bread and this cup and you bless it and you bless, continue to bless our lives and help us remember that you gave us that ultimate freedom. You gave us that freedom to live our life, to show others your love. It is in your son's name we pray, amen.
the body of Christ broken for you, the cup of the new covenant poured out for you, the gifts of God for the people of God. We now come to a point in our service where we get to celebrate how blessed we have been. We have truly been blessed by just being able to be here today. So if that can be your only gift back, that is more than enough. But, of course, we do have to keep giving those blessings so that we can continue to bless those around us. Let us give of our tithes and our offerings. Father God, you are the giver of all good things, and your word makes clear that every good and perfect gift comes from you. We ask that you accept these gifts and use them to your glory. May these gifts bring shelter to those in need, comfort to the sick, rest to the weary, and hope to the hopeless. Amen. When I was getting up to go do the prayer in the early service this morning, I um, was reminded of the fact that when I do a funeral at Paul's funeral home, the gentlemen who work there make fun of me because my funeral shoes squeak when I walk down the aisle. And they like to pick on me. And I think they're so handsome. They're patent leather, they have tassels, but they're loud. <laughs> so walking to do the prayer, in shoes that were not my funeral shoes. <laughs> ha! I was making noise in church. So I thought, well, fail there. And then come to find out doing communion, these shoes make noise too. <laughs> so much for silence, huh? Well, um, I grew up with complete and total access to an individual, my grandfather, who was passionate about words. He wrote them in books, he edited others' words, and he worked for a company whose sole purpose was collecting words between two covers to share with the world. There was a dictionary or three, 
in every room of the house except the bathroom. And there was an intentionality with the use of words that was ever present. My grandfather believed the more words an individual had a command of, the better they could communicate. And communication was essential to the betterment of society and the world's continued existence. It was annoying to me and a constant frustration, his hyper-focusing on words. When I wanted to know how to spell a word or what a word meant, he would say, look it up. And of course, in one of my more frustrated moments, I said, how can I look it up if I don't know how to spell it? <laughs> so born of that interaction was the three letter rule. If my phonetics failed me and I couldn't hunt and peck to the word, I would be given the first three letters to look it up. My grandfather challenged me from my earliest memories to use words correctly or to find a better, bigger word and have command of it. My first big word, my first favorite word, was this one. <laughs> Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. 34 letters to say something was better than and beyond great, and I used it as often as I could. Little did I know that other people had seen Mary Poppins too and had a command of that word. The second word I had a love-hate relationship with was this one, <laughs> Mississippi. I loved it because I learned that it came from an Indian word that meant big river, and I could spell it this way. M I squiggle letter squiggle letter I squiggle letter squiggle letter I hunchback hunchback I. And again, an unfortunate situation arose. I spelled it that way in a second grade spelling bee, and I didn't win. <laughs> Hence the hate part of my relationship with that word. I took Latin for seven years at my family's request to broaden my understanding of words and language. They thought it would improve my skill set for the SATs, and to some degree it did. For many years, I could figure out the meaning of words because of the Latin root of the word. But I think at 50, I have forgotten more of it than I remember. Having kids in high school and now college turned me into the person who was asked, what does that word mean? Before performing a Google search to see if I was in fact correct. Often I do know the general meaning of the word they ask or have a familiarity with it. Out of curiosity and admittedly increasing uncertainty in my memory, I have been searching for the definitions of words that I thought I understood. I've been shaken. Many times, a word doesn't exactly mean what I thought it did, or even remotely what I thought it did. I think of a clip from a movie called The Princess Bride. Have any of you seen it? Mm -hmm. oh, okay, yes. there's a one, there's a little. If you haven't seen it, you go home and watch it. <laughs> So there is um, a character in it whose name is Venzini, and he says, inconceivable to everything. And the big giant, whose name is Fezzik, answers back, I don't think that word means what you think it means. So I have a genuine curiosity of words, and I love being reintroduced to them. And what happened this week was that I got reintroduced to the word hope. Last Sunday, when Jacob was preaching, he mentioned that a wish was different from a hope. And my mind started turning that over and over again. What was hope? How would I define it? I knew hope wasn't a wish, but it felt closer to a wish and maybe even more of a thing rooted in a feeling. And I realized for me, hope was one of those words that I used a lot but never really thought too much about or could articulate its actual meaning. So I got to thinking on it and reading about it. Hope is defined in Webster's as an intransitive verb, to cherish a desire with anticipation, to want something to happen or to be true, or as a noun, the desire accompanied by expectation of or belief in fulfillment. That was a much more concrete assessment of the word tied to the emotions or feelings I assumed hope was 
tied to, so I dug a little deeper. Guess what? In other languages and in big biblical terms, hope isn't defined exactly the same way. It's much more of a concrete thing. In Hebrew, hope, the word tikva, is not tied to a feeling. It is an expectation. And the root word means rope, or what one is bound to. In Greek, hope is the word elpis, which also means expectation, but goes on to be defined as trust and confidence. And when used biblically, hope is, and I quote, the confident expectation of what God has promised, and its strength, hope, is in his faithfulness. So that definition of hope as a rope, that binding hope does for us, is to God. Our hope is in God and in the certainty and faithfulness of him. The biblical definition and understanding of hope holds so much more power for me than our Webster's version of today does. Hope, I now come to realize, is a word of great power. It's not the feel-good, wishy-washy word I once assumed it to be. Biblical hope has the power and the certainty to change trajectories, communities, and lives. It holds tremendous weight and value. Now, one of the ways to better understand a word in context is to replace it with a synonym you are better acquainted with or the definition of the word. So I pulled the next four scriptures, and there were so many more I could have chosen from, that all spoke on hope. They're probably quite familiar to you. The first one is Isaiah, and he mentions hope in this way. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. So let's replace the word hope with its definition confident. Those who are confident in the Lord or those who are roped to the Lord, he will renew their strength. That lands very differently to me. We know how hard this way of Christianity is, so having the confidence in God because of who God is, well then you will soar and run and walk the walk. Psalm 71 verse 5, and I'm sorry, but I made an error. We got to back up to four first. Deliver me, my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of those who are evil and cruel. For you have been my hope, sovereign Lord, my confidence since my youth. With our new understanding of the biblical hope, again, replace the word hope. For you have been where my trust is, what I am roped to, the supreme authority, my Lord. This person writing in the psalm is understood to be older, looking back on their life and acknowledges his binding to God. It's almost like saying, I can handle what's been thrown at me over all of these years because my confidence has always been in God. And then we have another prophet weighing in on hope, Jeremiah, chapter 29, verse 11. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. These people who had been cast out living in Babylon without a nation and hearing that God had a plan for them, that was their fear not moment. That was the gods I've thrown out a lifeline to you. Their future was found in their confidence in the Lord. And then we have Paul weighing in on hope. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. That single sentence I read is the most popular definition used to describe faith. Our faith in real time is the certainty of our expectations, our confidence, our roping to, our trust, hope in God and his fulfillment of his promises. 
Each of these verses gives the reader and the believer more than a feeling of comfort and something to look forward to. These verses give the reader and the believer a certainty of what is to come and what is to be that can be trusted in because our hope, our rope, our expectation and confidence is in God. God does not fail his children. So you see, hope is an immensely powerful tool. I read a study done by two economists who were using existing data to track the effects of hope. In the 30s and 40s, a survey was done with a group of participants who were asked about their hope for their future, whether their lives would work out or not. They were at the time in their 20s and 30s. People's hope, previously referred to as optimism in the studies, caused measurable results in the lives of the participants and by extension, their communities. Those who answered positively were more likely to be alive in 2015 than those in their same peer group, age, race, and gender, or than those who responded negatively. And guess what? For those who were hopeful, they had better end results, less sicknesses, more measurable successes than those who did not. A group of children in Peru who were first-generation college students experienced a higher degree of hope for their futures over a three-year period of time than that of their parents because of the increase in education opportunities. And when asked, they attributed their hope and success to family members or members in the community that poured into their lives and supported and encouraged them to go to college. Two economists and several psychologists are making the argument that hope, confidence, and certainty of expectations is a measurable tool that can be used for society. And if measured and tracked, <laughs> imagine what crises could be avoided. Imagine what breakdowns in communities and societies could be avoided. When our hope is not but a mere emotion or feeling, when our hope as Christians properly understood is the confidence we have in God, when we are roped to God and confident in his purpose, imagine what communities might look like, how we might track our success. I imagine that that would be kingdom building right there. Hope is all around us and often being ushered in by others. Driving down 264 this week, I saw something that made me pause. It was a row after row after row of zinnias. Imagine my surprise when the same image showed up on my Instagram feed. That's from Petals and Produce, and it says, where flowers bloom, so does hope. Images like that make something good well up inside of me from deep down inside. I found hope in the Chalice Hymnal this week, multiple pages of music dedicated to our hope in God, and a list of additional hymns containing the idea of hope without directly using the word. The words of those hymns repeatedly reminded me of my confidence in God and the hope found in his ability to provide. I found hope in this quote. Hope looks to the future, postured for something greater. It looks with expectation that something will happen. I found hope in familiar scriptures, and I found strength in the Hebrew and Greek definitions of hope, the ancient understanding and biblical understanding of hope. So I have come to some conclusions with my newfound command of this word, hope. If we are persons of faith, then we cannot be hopeless, only hopeful. Hope is a reality that has no end. Hope is resilient. It lets you acknowledge the good and the hard. Hope shouldn't be hidden. I don't think you could hide it if you tried. Hope should not and cannot be surrendered or lost. Hope should be practiced. Hope should be shared. 
and hope is a choice. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able, and we will sing our closing hymn.